Good morning, everyone. Uh, so lovely to have you here. Um, everyone's very quiet in the chat this morning. Let's get this chat going. So uh, do pop in the chat feature where you are watching from uh, this morning. It'll be really, really lovely uh, to chat is disabled. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know what to do with that. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, well, we are going to have a very, very full uh, Q&A feature today. You know what? Let's just use the Q&A feature. Why not? So uh, head down to the Q&A feature uh, that's found down below um, and we'll get a live counter of how many messages are coming through. So do pop in there where you're watching from and uh, let's use that. So uh, that's found down below. I, I, I have no idea why the chat feature is disabled. Um, that must be very new. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, hello everyone. So lovely to have you here today. Um, it's awesome to have you here. Usually, I level two challenges at you. I usually say, uh, keep that chat feature buzzing throughout the duration of today's session, and then also share on social media your biggest takeaway from today's uh, session. Now, obviously, uh, the chat feature is disabled for some reason, so let's use the Q&A feature for the duration of today's session. Uh, and I can see folks in London. I can see folks uh, where else? In Norwich, Portsmouth, uh, Essex, East London, uh, another one in Essex, Ashdown Forest, Saffron Walden, uh, Cheltenham, uh, the sunny Wirral, West London. Incredible. Thank you all so, so much for being here. And I hope you're not melting. Uh, if you've got any background noise, it's because my fan is positioned right to the left of me down here. Now, uh, let's get going with today's session because it's a little bit uh, different from usual as we're not using the chat feature. So let's just get on with introducing our guest for today, who is one of the single most impressive human beings that I know. It's Max Hoppy. Max is one of those self-improver types. One is not running Ironman events. He's raising money for charity. And this year he's raised at least 40,000 pounds that I'm aware of, uh, which is amazing. And when he's not running Ironman, events or raising money for charity, then he's co-running the agency that the drum uh, gave the Grand Prix prize for uh, the best uh, agency or the best campaign for uh, very, very recently. Uh, needless to say, he's one of these human beings that is just endlessly impressive. More deep than that, though, I call Max a friend. He's caring, proactive and gives, gives a crap. I adore this man. And this man has been on a journey for these past few years. Without giving the game away, Max knows what it's like to be someone who doesn't like public speaking all that much. And I think that might be an understatement. But he's also someone who's worked bloody hard at it. And today his grace the stage is at some of the biggest marketing events through, throughout the world and in our industry. He's just wonderful. Max is doing a lot of the heavy lifting today, gladly, uh, given, given the chat feature situation. Um, so Max will have a presentation for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have time for Q&A. So in the same area where I've encouraged you to pop in your, your chat messages, if you've got any question, questions throughout the duration of today's session, also do pop them in there and I'll keep an eye on and at the end we'll, we'll take any questions uh, that come through, or certainly the most thumbed up ones or the ones that seem to take our fancy the most. Before we get going, I want to say a big, big thank you to our uh, sponsors. And this week we have a featured sponsor who is Cambridge Marketing College. Now, there's a lot of uh, places I could go with Cambridge Marketing College. I could speak about how lovely they are, how they're local to us, about the history that we've got with them, having them sponsored the marketing meetup since day one. But really, I think the thing that they'd most appreciate me letting you know about is the fact that if you are, need marketing qualifications or apprenticeships, then Cambridge Marketing College is your place to go. I know that a bunch of folks from the marketing meetup uh, community have done exactly that and had, had a really great experience with Cambridge Marketing College. So do take the time to check them out if you're looking for qualifications or apprenticeships. Also, a big thank you to our other sponsors who will be featured on rotation throughout the rest of this season, although we've only got one, one episode left of this season, which is mad. Uh, so a big, big thank you to Impression, Attest, Hrefs, uh, Redgate and brand recruitment. One thing you'll note with one of, with our sponsors is today I published a survey from one of our sponsors, a test, uh, which I did myself last night uh, using their platform. So it's well worth checking that out. It was all about sort of the ranked importance of factors for people applying for jobs. Uh, it was super easy to use a test to do just that. 
with all that said and my love for max conveyed and also my gratitude for everyone watching in today then uh max it's uh it's over to you my friend thank you so much for taking the time dude really uh thanks for having me i'm sorry the chat function has upset you uh but we'll survive <laughs> we will survive we'll be fine <laughs> i have no idea what happened i'm i'm, I'm i am upset about that because honestly it's always so great but you know what we're going to persevere because communities uh do just that so yeah keep that chat feature going in the q a and uh, you've planted a little seed i will pick on it during this presentation but when you present or pitch or do any speaking um, there's a couple of things you've got. A bit. One is you've got to test all the little gadgets and gizmos that could go wrong. And I know you'll have probably done that. So the second thing you need is a get out of jail free card mm. is what are you going to do when it goes, when, when something doesn't quite go right, you want to have probably practiced for that in some way. Yeah. Anyway, so I feel that that's a, an appropriate tee up, Joe. <laughs> I think, I think we've done well. <laughs> nice. Fair. Over to you, my friend. So the title of this uh, presentation is How to Deliver Great Presentations, Speeches and Pitches. And before we get into it, I'll build on Joe's introduction. This slide uh, sums up my career in marketing. So I started off life selling washing machines online. I also sold some double, double ovens, refrigerators, which today, uh, fun facts, which I wasn't planning to share, Fridge sales, when the weather goes hot, go bananas because for what appliances break down when they've got to work harder. So the appliance retailers put the prices up. So if you're thinking of buying a fridge and you don't need to, I would just hold off until the temperature drops again. Okay, I left the world of appliances and I joined Google and I helped other people sell stuff online. All sorts of things, skateboards, laser eye surgery, everything in the middle of those two uh, kind of juxtaposed things. I then wanted to start a family. And my family and my wife's family were in the north. So I left London and I looked for a job in digital marketing and I got a job as a head of digital marketing at Iceland Foods. Now I don't talk about this job very much. It's not on my LinkedIn. And it's because I was only there for three months it was, uh, I went down in flames and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few slides time. So what happened next? Well, I felt I was unemployable. So I started my own agency with my brother and a chap called Will Pigeon, who's not my biological brother, but he feels like a brother from another mother. It's a wonderful man. And that's what I'm doing today. And we, you know, we do digital marketing. And our thing, I suppose our positioning is we only work with 10 clients. That's, that's kind of baked into our positioning. And that, that's quite deliberate. It's because we want to do the deep, we want to do the work that allows you to spend a load of time in the business. So we put this kind of beautiful constraint on the agency from day one that we won't work with more than 10 people. Now I've got another thing that I've recently started doing. And that is uh, something called the Keynote Club. The Keynote Club it has been going for three months. It's a public speaking club for marketers. It's free. And we meet on Zoom like this every two weeks. And we practice, we practice. You know, it's just a place to practice and learn how to get better at public speaking. So there's my potted career in a slide. This is what we're going to go through today. I'm going to I'm going to tell a backstory, which I suppose is a built out version of the career slide that you just saw. But I'm going to try and isolate some things in that story that hopefully will be helpful to you. We're then going to switch gear and I'm going to talk about something called personal readiness. When you're going to speak, present, pitch, how do you get your mind in the right place to do a great job? We're going to switch gear again and talk about speech readiness. That's a different thing. Speech readiness is about whoosh, whipping your speech, your, your story, your pitch into shape so that when you deliver it well, it lands and you create some sort of change. That's usually what you're trying to do. And I'll end this session with uh, some signposting of where you could go next if you want to practice and get better at public speaking. Okay, let's go. As I'm a marketer, I like a graph. Digital marketer, we like graphs. 
So I'm going to tell my backstory with a graph. Let me introduce the graph. On the horizontal, uh, on the vertical rather, vertical, horizontal, I get those confused, vertical axes, we have um, good fortune at the top, bad fortune at the bottom. The horizontal axis is the B, E axis, the beginning and the end. Shit. So the worst happened. Literally, the like, I don't believe you can get worse than this. I stood up. If, you, if you've not noticed, Iceland Foods is right in the bad fortune start of the story part of the graph. I stood up in front of, I don't know, 40 people to present. And a little voice entered my head and it said, don't panic. And of course, I start, you know, what, what else are you going to do but start to panic? That little voice then said, make sure you keep breathing. And suddenly my breathing became labored. My heart rate started going and I couldn't speak. I, I had a panic attack. You know, that's, that's what you, you'd call what I had. And I don't know how long I didn't speak. I, I don't really have good time memory of it. It felt like a long time. I then managed to tell everybody that I was having a panic attack. And in doing that, weirdly, I grounded myself. You know, I, I suppose I came into the moment because I'm telling everyone that I was having a panic attack. And I was able to finish the presentation that I was doing. And about three weeks after that event, I quit my job. Um, I told myself I was quitting for reasons that were nothing to do with that uh, panic attack event. But with a bit of uh, distance and perspective from it, I quit because I was embarrassed and ashamed. And I fed myself rational reasons that I should leave as well. And some of those were true, but the reason I left was not, not those things. I left because I was embarrassed that I'd had a panic attack in front of four people. So I now had a choice. I had a choice to either let this thing stop me ever speaking again. You know, I wouldn't be here today. If I'd, well, you know, well, bollocks, I've given away the choice now, haven't I? So I had a choice of never speaking again or trying to not let this thing stop me. Okay. And I'm, I'm really proud that I decided to do the latter. And the first thing I did, it probably took a couple of months. It maybe wasn't like the day after. I joined a public speaking charity called Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an American organization. It has been going for a long time, maybe 100 years. And on a weekly basis, you meet uh, in your local town or city and you learn about what makes a good speech and you practice. And I think the other thing that you do that's really helpful is you mix with other people trying to do the same thing. And, and, and you see, and two things happen actually. You're massively inspired by people that clearly have fear that lean into it and do it anyway. But then you also realize this thing can be learnt because you see people that clearly don't have the natural, they didn't start with the natural ingredients, delivering, delivering powerful speeches. And it's really inspiring. So I went to Toastmasters to rebuild. I then decided I wanted to take my speaking out of Toastmasters, out of the bubble of Toastmasters. But I didn't want to risk my job. So I approached universities and I asked if I could speak to their students about marketing. And this door actually is really open. Lots of, lots of unis are desperate for practitioners that have got... Um, I don't know, like relevant, cutting edge, bleeding edge experience to come and talk to the students and also add some variety to the module. So I spoke at all sorts of unis, Manchester, um, the University of Bradford, Salford. Joe introduced me to the University of Cambridge, actually. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and, I, and I just cut my teeth speaking to these students. By the way, that was quite scary. Like a group of students, it's a big number often, and they're not, they're on TikTok, they're not giving you like feedback that you're doing a good job. So it's a really nice place to practice. 
And if it goes wrong, you don't have to hand in your notice. So what happened next? Okay, we're now above the good fortune line. We're in the, we're in the, we're in the clear. I started working on my mind. So I did things, Joe referenced Iron Man. Like that's no, that's linked to this. I started exercising uh, every day, uh, which I still do. And that, that's, a, that's one of the best habits, I think actually, that I hope I don't ever lose. Um, I absolutely love it. Uh, and it helps me in so many ways, mentally, as well as physically. And what, one of the things that I, I struggled with more than exercise, exercise came quite naturally, was meditation. And I challenged myself to meditate 100 days in a row, which I did. I now don't. I meditate as and when, um, probably a couple of times a week. Uh, but I did my 100. So we're, we're, in, um, we're in a great place. You know, done, solved until until it happened again in a environment like this i was working uh quite like a side hustle and i was working as a teaching assistant for scott galloway who is a fam reasonably famous marketing professor in the states he lectures at uh, nyu stern he has a podcast called pivot and an ed tech startup called section four where i was a teaching assistant I still am and I was running a workshop with maybe, I don't know, 30 to 40 similar number <clears throat> people from all over the world. It was, it was a multinational audience. And the little voice entered my head and I just slammed my laptop. <laughs> and I composed myself. I was like, oh my God, they're all on the Zoom <laughs> waiting for this thing to start. I'd said hello to some of them. Uh, composed myself, I think I got a glass of water and I rebooted my laptop and, and I did a good job. And I know I did a good job actually, because I got some feedback afterwards, uh, which I was, I was staggered by. So of all the 50, there are 50 teaching assistants, there's, there's a lot of us, and each of them are evaluated as kind of student uh, feedback, whatever. And I, I came top of the survey that they ran. Now, interestingly, um, and I'm really proud of that, actually. But I don't remind myself. I'm glad I put it in this presentation because I forgot. I don't remind myself of that. What I do remind myself of is the laptop slamming incident, which clearly had like no impact on the on the student experience. Clearly, but annoyingly, the human brain is wired to forget all the good, forget the good stuff. Let's just dwell on the thirty seconds of disaster. Um, or perceived disaster. And I'm sure back in the day that was helpful. Like when we were up against saber-toothed tigers and we were living in caves, you know, being paranoid and fearful of dying, uh, you know, every, in every moment probably kept us alive. But I think it's less useful today. Okay, the good news here is I'd already proven I could get out of the hole once. So I did a lot of the things that I've already spoken about already and some extras. The first extra one was making it public. This presentation is an example of that actually. By making it public, one of the fears, the irrational fears you have with a fear of public speaking is that everyone's gonna find you out. And if you make it public, you, well, you've done it. <laughs> you, you take that problem away because you've owned letting everyone find out. So I found talking about it publicly was actually a very helpful thing. And I loved a byproduct of that was I connected with so many people that are in the same boat that wrote to me privately. Um, I took a load of people to Toastmasters uh, actually on the back of doing this. So I made it public. I then hired a coach initially for my business because I wanted us to get good at pitching, like really good at pitching and presenting, because that's kind of our battleground as an agency. So I hired Naluka, uh, who was recommended, I can't remember by who, but recommended by somebody in my network. And she did a training session, a three-part training session in my business, which is really affordable. Um, interestingly, she was working at KPMG at the time as head of marketing or something. And it was kind of her side hustle. So very affordable. And then since I've hired Naluka four or five times for like a one-on-one -on -one pre-game um, session. So before a big speech, 
I just book her in uh, the week before I go through it. Or, you know, I say, when I say speech, by the way, swap out presentation, like public speaking event. So big public speaking event. I get in a Luca for an hour and she has me present and she just breaks it down and gives me feedback. And I find that tightens my speeches up uh, enormously. Okay, I then uh, set more public speaking goals and they got progressively bigger. I didn't start off with the big stuff. You know, I started off with the unis. And now I started going after things that were maybe more professionally interesting to me. And my big one last year, my biggest was Brighton SEO, which is maybe, I don't know, like 3,000 people on the main stage, something like that. So um, for, for, for me, that was quite a big um, audience given where, where this story starts. And this year is no different. I have, I'm a bit of a goal setter. Uh, I have eight goals each year and you can see number six is complete 12 public speaking uh, things. This counts. So you're helping me today. Uh, thank you. And the end of the story, which I'm very proud of. I am. I'm delighted with this. We start the keynote club uh, three months ago, which is now help, you know, it's helping uh, probably 20 marketers every, every fortnight which is just, just a wonderful thing. And, the, and the, 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 the real messed up thing about this is the keynote club wouldn't exist were it not for the start of the story, the Iceland um, disaster. It wouldn't exist. So I no longer, I wouldn't swap the Iceland thing now. No way. I needed the fuel from it to do the keynote club. And I think this is another one of life's... Um, fucked up lessons, right? Um, forgive the profanity, but anything good I seem to have done in my life tends to start with something pretty rubbish. Uh, you know, my MBA, I messed up my undergrad degree. My Ironman, I felt like I was a skinny, weak kid growing up. Like there's always something that I tap into that's like quite painful actually, that then allows me to do things that make me really proud and fulfilled. And something, something in there. I don't know. Let's move on. Okay. We've done the backstory. Where are we in this presentation? We've done part one. And I shared how a couple of panic attacks led to quite a lot of change in personal growth. And this was a classic. If I was going to analyze how I just delivered that, um, I just used a very simple story structure that is kind of the it's the voyage and return story um, where man or woman goes out, hits trial and tribulation. Things get a bit better. They get a bit worse. They get a bit better again. Right. Personal readiness. What on earth is this about? So in that uh, story I just presented, I thought a lot about these two. Uh, I reflected a lot about these two events. Probably too much. Some of it not healthy, but a lot of it actually good, healthy reflection because I isolated the common themes that uh, triggered them to happen. And there were three. The first one, and th these are obvious by the way. The first one, I didn't know the content. At Iceland Foods, I didn't tell you that 10 minutes before speaking, that's when I'd been asked to speak and I was presenting somebody else's uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I remember this vividly. I do the slide clicker and I look back there's this graph on the slide. I have absolutely no idea what it means or what it's saying. So I'll look again. Nope, no idea. And that was the actual initial trigger for the little voice in my head. Um, forgive me one minute. My light's just gone off. I'll, I'll switch it back on. Ten seconds. We're back. We're back. Okay, so Iceland, I'm presenting something. I've never, I've not even seen it. I knew the theme of what I was supposed to be presenting, but I didn't know the slides. So of course I wasn't prepared. At section four, I'm presenting Scott Galloway's marketing framework. I don't know it. It's clunky in my mouth and it should, it should kind of just, you know, it, when, you, when you've practiced well, it should just kind of you know, slip off the tongue easily. Second common theme. There was a high stress moment within 15 minutes of me starting to speak. 
at Iceland Foods, I had an altercation with a colleague, a lovely lady called Wendy Swash, who I, I love dearly. Um, we spoke quite recently and it wasn't, it wasn't like we didn't have a fight, but we just disagreed on something. And I think voices were slightly raised, heart rate went up, blood pressure went up. At section four, I was presenting this workshop, I was running this workshop at 8 p.m. UK time because the course was on East Coast of America time, so it's quite late. And about, I don't know, 20 minutes before, I was trying to get a child to, to sleep, uh, a one-year-old child that was having absolutely none of it and was just screaming in my face. And I then had to pass the child to my wife, who was then quite grumpy with me that I was just leaving her with... Um, with a screaming child to go off and, you know, hunting uh, on Zoom with a load of Americans. So uh, quite high stress, not mindful uh, in the 15 minutes before both panic attacks. And then finally, which is the story of my life, I suspect yours, I was tired, but I was particularly tired. I hadn't rested the night before. I think I'd, I'd had a half bottle of wine the night before um, the Iceland experience. So the conclusion here is I didn't have, I didn't know what, I, didn't, I hadn't coined personal readiness um, at the time, but I then thought, right, I wasn't, I didn't get my mind ready. I wasn't personally ready for these events. So what can I do to get to make sure that doesn't happen again? So I created a good old checklist, the personal readiness checklist, seven points. Now there's three kind of themes here. The first theme is about um, practice. Okay, how have I got my reps in? And I literally do tally my practice bit for this event. I try and practice in the environment that I'm going to be presenting in, whether that's, that's a stage, I will try and get to the room. This is a bit different because it's virtual. And I'll want to do it in front of humans. I do a lot of recording myself, uh, but I'll also want to look at someone in the white of the eyes. And then finally, which Joe demonstrated in a beautiful way at the start of this uh, talk, is that I will make sure all of my equipment's tested. Um, I will double check the chat function so I don't disappoint all the people that were desperate today to use that chat functionality. Here's my proof, by the way. There's my tally. Um, the, uh, the thing on the right-hand side is a useful, a useful little tool called Soapbox. It's a little browser extension that allows you to record yourself while presenting a deck and then watch it back. So I use that quite a lot, and there's others. I think Loom is a good example of that as well, and they don't need to cost anything. And C3 is an agency in Leeds. They're actually a competitor. And a few weeks ago, they asked me to present to their team on this topic. And I said, yeah, um, for two reasons. One, they made a charity donation for me to do it, um, which is, was actually very generous of them. But two was because of you guys. I, I was using them as my practice in front of people. I didn't tell them that. Uh, not that they'd mind, but they were my... There was 30 to 50 people in that one. There's hundreds in this one. So it was just a nice stepping stone to be able to do it in front of you guys today. Okay, five and six. This one is about, it's about fighting the stress. So have I exercised on the day of the speech? Have I done something mindful? That 30 minutes before, protect it. Um, and I try and do something mindful. Today, what did this mean? It meant I was running this morning. I run most mornings. And uh, right before me and Joe had a little sink at quarter past eight, I was on my headspace at 10 past eight, which Joe, I didn't tell him, but now you know. Um, and I just do that. It's one of my little habits. Before a big speech, I'll just do a 10-minute semi-guided meditation and just, just sit with my, my head. And finally, um, the sleep. You can't guarantee a good night's sleep, particularly if you've got young children, but you can control for a few things. You can decide not to drink alcohol. So I now will never drink alcohol the night before a speech. And the second thing you can control for is the time you get into bed. Yeah, you might not drop off to sleep, but I make sure I'm in bed for nine o'clock before a speech. Now, if it isn't obvious, all that stuff's a load of work. It's a load of time, particularly the repetitions. And it does, it takes time. I put out a post on LinkedIn um, four months ago, I think it says. And the title of it was something like, um, 
uh, how to make a five to seven minute speech look easy. And the reason you can't read the slide, which is deliberate, is because there's a load of stuff that goes into making a five to seven minute speech look easy. There's a load of time. And I think it's the same for anything. If you want to get good at anything hard, you've got to put the reps in, you've got to put the work in. Okay, I'll leave you with a little confession. I actually don't always do all seven, but what I do do, for, well, for the big ones I do, for the big ones I do, but even the little ones, I will hit all three bases. I will make sure I'm familiar with the content. I will do something mindful right before, and I will, I will always do the nine o'clock no booze thing. Personal readiness, done. So where are we? Um, we did the backstory, the man in the hole story, got in the hole, out the hole, back in the hole, out the hole. I then shared how I'd reflected on the two panic attack incidents, and I gave you three things that I found were common, um, not being familiar with the content, not having something shit happen within 30 minutes of speaking, got my stress up, and not protecting the night before, and trying to save the sleep. We're now going to talk about speech readiness, which is a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the anatomy of a speech presentation pitch. Now I learned about what I think makes a good speech presentation or pitch in these places and some others, but these were the big ones. Toastmasters, we, there's quite a lot of education attached to Toastmasters and you break it down and you realize it can be learned. Niluka brought a different perspective. Niluka studied rhetoric at Harvard University and would often bring uh, philosophy, actually. She brings philosophy into how she um, critiques speeches. She talks about Socrates and rhetoric and things, which I find fascinating and a different dimension. And then the keynote club is where I continue to practice. So I'm going to talk about seven things that I think make a great speech. Number one, obviously, is, is it interesting? Kind of getting on base. Now, even though that sounds obvious, I think you can just, you can lift the bonnet on it a little bit. And I think of a few things. Does the speech have a purpose? Does it then deliver on what it sets out to, to do? And does that match what the audience wants? And I was thinking about this for, for you guys. This is kind of like marketing strategy. You know, segmentation, targeting, positioning. Targeting and positioning, it's like kind of, the same, I'm saying the same stuff, different words. Is the speech positioned? And does it kind of have a target? And does that position match the target? It's kind of marketing strategy. It's the same with public speaking. Think of, is it interesting? Is it purposeful? Number two, can I hear it? And is it clear? This is get on base stuff. But actually, I messed up last Tuesday. I helped Joe run the marketing meet at Manchester and we forgot the microphone. And we had a great guy talking, Duke Tanzan, the marketing director at Misguided. But the people at the back, they couldn't hear him. So, however good he was, it doesn't really, you know, he may have done the best presentation that the people in the front row have ever heard in their lives. The people on the back row have no idea. It, it just doesn't matter. So making sure the basics are in place is actually critical. And I see that missed by quite a lot of natural orators. They don't do the prep on it enough. And clarity is important. In my world, digital marketing, it's just, I mean, you, it's just stuffed full of TLAs, three-letter acronyms, PPC, SEO, CPC, CTR. When we're pitching to the CMO, um, that's my dad joke. When we're pitching to the chief marketing officer, the uh, you know it's it's frankly em embarrassing a lot of the things I see agencies do because the people in those jobs in the C-suite have so much in that coming at the brains. If you hit them with more um, acronymy lingo, um, it doesn't it, it doesn't work, and you and you and you don't land your message, create the change that you want to change. So I speak in. I'm from Bolton originally. And I think it serves me well to speak in a bit of Boltonese, particularly with the senior, the really senior decision makers. I often make my language even simpler and Bolton it up a bit. 
And I find that it's a misconception that you need to use long, complicated words with that audience to impress them. In my experience, it's the exact opposite. I also watch out for filler words. Filler words are things like ums, so's, ers. Now, I don't kill them all, but I do. It was interesting at Toastmasters, people actually count how many ers you, you say when you speak. And I did this little five minute talk, maybe even less. And they're like, yeah, you had um, 19 ers. 19. And that's, I don't want zero. I don't want one in every sentence. And it does just undermine your credibility. The experts don't have too many ers, ums, sos. So it's something that um, I actually think you can go around, you can be quite unaware that you do it. So it's helpful to find that out, how many filler words you use, and then maybe work on uh, tightening your speech and using uh, a few, a few fewer, a few fewer. Terrible grammar, let's move on. Structure, you know this one, beginning, middle and end. It's really important that people know where they are in a speech or presentation or pitch. And a movie, by the way. This, this kind of goes for any type of communication. The really weird art house movies that about three people like, that end at weird time, you know, like it ends when they open the black box and you're like, really? And it's just deeply unfulfilling. Um, but people pretend. Like those, they don't use this. And it's, and it's, and it's a problem. It's why they don't get a mainstream audience. So structure is important. I think you can do some clever things to signal what's coming next and do mini summaries as you go. I've been doing that. I'm trying to signal this behavior in this talk. When I get to the end of a section, I say I'm at the end of the section. I repeat kind of what I've said and then I signal what's next. And then when you start getting really good at this, you can start thinking about the shape in terms of the story arc of your narrative. And I referenced the uh, voyage and return, kind of the man on the journey story that maybe I used, the structure I used at the start of this uh, talk. There are lots of, well, there's, there's lots of others, there's seven others. And this book that I've screenshotted um, goes through the seven basic plots that basically all narratives hang off. They sometimes combine them. And when we pitch at Bind, I will use a killing the monster uh, narrative. So early on, I'll kind of say, okay, this is what we know about the situation. My analysis of what we know, I will just weave in some pretty scary monsters. They're not made up. <coughs> they exist. I can't. It's not about lying. It's about emphasizing certain points at certain times to make your story stronger. So I will start by dropping some big monsters in the heads of the decision makers. And sure enough, as my presentation goes on, together, we're going to kill that monster. <laughs> And you can do clever things like, uh, depending on the client, you may want to, some clients want to be really hands off and they want you to solve, solve all their problems without them in the room. Just go and do it for me. In which case you can be the slayer of the monster. Some clients want to come on the journey with you. In which case, make them the hero. You become the Gandalf. You're the Gandalf that's going to help them discover themselves to kill this monster. And you can do really nice things with uh, stories to help with your pitches and presentations. Okay, let's move on. Vocal variety. Now I work on this one and I struggle because my tone, as I speak to you now, I'm in this very similar kind of tone bracket and I try and get out of it, but I just default to it. Now there are other things you can do. Uh, volume is another thing you can play with. And I, I do that. You'll notice I've done some whispering into the microphone and I might get loud at certain points and I certainly change my speed. I put in pauses. I don't always, I'm quite good at doing that on the fly, but the big pauses you've got to plan for, the three seconders, when you're, you need to know where they're gonna be. And you wanna do them when you make a really impactful point. You wanna just leave it hanging. And it feels really uncomfortable actually when you do it. So force yourself to count in your head, one, two, three. And your audience won't feel as uncomfortable as you at all actually but you will, you'll be desperate to speak. You can also speed up. I speed up when I wanna, when it kind of matches my narrative. So I was talking about creativity recently and I was trying to make the point that when you're busy, it's hard to have creative thoughts. 
So I think I said did something like when you're um, sat at your desk, you got your emails opening, you're getting WhatsApp, Slacks, you've got oh, you're on a deadline, your boss is da 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 da, and I just got the tempo da 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 to match the point that I was trying to make. Okay, number five, hand gestures, physical movement, body language, harder on Zoom than in person, but not impossible. You can do you can do things. You can also, you've noticed that I've done a bit of this. You can get close. I wear glasses. I've not got them on. I put them on. One little trick. If I really want to make a point. So I want to just switch the vibe. Like I want to switch the tempo. Maybe I want to slow it right down and really emphasize some points in a presentation. Take my glasses off. Maybe get a bit closer. And then I'll do And, I'll, and that will be quite deliberate. So now you know, if you see me take my glasses off, I've probably like embarrassingly thought about that at that time. Okay, number six. If you're using a deck as I am now, does it enhance the speech? And most of the time in work, we're using decks when we present and pitch. Now, I could do a whole session on decks. Uh, I've got some strong points of view, some of them slightly wild and um, I'll have to save them for another day, but I'll give you three things, three things that I think are really important. And I would say, actually, if the one change you make on the back of hearing me talk today is the first one, it'll have been a no brainer that you turn up today. So the first point, make the title of your slide land the main point that you're trying to deliver. I'm gonna say it again, because it's too important not to. Make the title, of your slide land the main point that you want to deliver. Here's why. Because people don't read your slides. Some do, most don't. The thing that's read the most is the title, simple. So use it, like that's your, that's your workhorse on the slide. An example, I'll just give you an example of, of what I mean by it. So let's say that we've just delivered um, 500 new customers, 500 extra customers in July versus June. Brilliant news. So a way that you could present that on a slide is June versus July performance. And then you have a graph or a bar chart and then the point that July is better than June. Or, which I think is the wrong answer. Or you say July beat June or July we acquired 500 more customers than June because that's the actual meat that you're trying to land. And then you have your graph and your supporting points. It's a subtle change. It makes a huge difference. Next point something visual. There are three types of learner, an auditory learner, a visual learner, a kinesthetic learner. The kinesthetic is learning by doing and feeling. When you present, don't ignore the visual one. It's like a third of people. So I add, I just add something with visual interest to just hang a few, hang the points off, even if it's something daft, like I've deliberately shown you a, like a simple example, a couple of emojis, it just adds some visual interest to a slide. And the final thing that I would suggest you do is when you are reviewing your beautiful deck before you present it, just imagine that your audience is on their smartphone, sat on the toilet, just flicking through it. And they may be just scanning the slide titles. Does your narrative get across? Do the main points get across? Do the main takeaways get across? It's the toilet test. Imagine, I mean, don't literally imagine, but you, you get the point. Okay, let's move on. Finally, the most unhelpful slide in this presentation, because how do you do this? Is the speaker comfy and relaxed? Now, this one actually, for me, <laughs> is all about personal readiness. Getting your mind right. The first part of this, um, this presentation, personal readiness. And then I think if you do some work on the speech readiness, you will naturally uh, you'll just start delivering a good speech and you'll kind of ease into it and it'll feel good and then you'll get more comfy and that'll be obvious and et cetera, et cetera. So here is, um, let's, let's end this section with two things. Here is a slide that breaks my slide etiquette rule. And all it is, I just want to demonstrate, this is the scorecard we use at uh, the keynote club. When someone does a speech, we evaluate it and uh, we give them feedback and then they hopefully can work on certain areas and try and get better. And I just want to impress upon you that this is a learned, this can be a learned thing. 
this absolute, I've seen people that suck at public speaking, smash people that actually are naturals because they try harder and work at this. And my, my, my little bit of advice, I suppose, to, to end this section on is don't try and do all things at once. This is a one brick at a time. I usually have one thing I'm focusing on for each speech that I do. Okay. So where are we? We've uh, done the backstory, personal readiness, and we've just dissected what makes up a great speech. And I've just signaled a nice mini summary. So we're gonna conclude on what you should do next, should you want to work at speaking, presenting, pitching. If it's not obvious, I've been practicing a lot. And actually for years now, not months, not weeks, for years. And I think I'm probably at about 10%, like, a, like I'm not nearly finished. I don't, this is not finished article that you're seeing in any, in any way, loads of working areas. And I will continue to build this muscle. And I believe that if I stop, it'll atrophy. And I made the, um, another slightly cringing LinkedIn post was I've made this comparison. I think that, that muscle, like if, you, if you're a gym person, there's so much crossover with building muscle and building the oratory muscle. Um, it's about starting quite small reps and sets, rest, resting the mind, preparing the mind and giving yourself time. So where can you get your reps in? The three places I'll signpost are Toastmasters. If you Google your town or city in Toastmasters, you'll find a club. Uh, if, you, if you can't find one, if you're in um, somewhere, I don't know, like the Shetland Islands, there will be a um, virtual club that I'm sure you can join. It's about £15 a month. So it's an accessible price point and it's a charity. They're not trying to make money out of you every, you know, at every angle. Another thing you might try is you could reach out to Naluka. I asked her permission to give uh, you her name, Naluka Kavanagh. Um, if you search for her on LinkedIn, she's got Oxford in the background. Christ, she studied at, she studied at Oxford, then Harvard. That makes me feel insecure. Um, but she's lovely. She's actually just an absolute lovely human. So I re really um, suggest you reach out to her if you're interested. And finally, come to the keynote club. It's free. We do it every two weeks. Thursday at 12 noon so it's in working hours but if you work for a company <coughs> that's like normal like of course they'll give you an hour to do something that's like this because it's going to help you be better at your job and you can sign up um, our website is the keynoteclub.com and just click the register I can't remember what the CTA is it's the first CTA you come to it's massive I think it might be purple and this is why it's worth it this is the um, a message I got from somebody, and I've had I mean, it's been going for three months. People have got new jobs. They've won big, the biggest deals they ever have done. They've done things they didn't think that they would be able to do. And this was the first little message that validated that we were onto something after the first event. I'll read the first two sentences. I think last night might have been a turning point for me. I'm finding myself wondering this morning what I can do next. And the beautiful truth here is that lots of people that don't do public speaking or are scared of it have got all these, these limits that they've put on themselves. Limiting beliefs, I think, is the expression. And they're exactly that. They're beliefs. They're not reality. They're beliefs. But, they're, but they're, they're real in that they do stop you when they're there. And at the keynote club, I think we show people how to smash through a limiting belief. And when they do it, they look at some of their other limiting beliefs in other parts of their life that have nothing to do with public speaking. And suddenly the world of possibility just feels clearer and more exciting. Let's end with a massive summary uh, with a load of emojis. So we've covered four things today. I started with a backstory. It was a man in a hole story. I got in a hole. I used that as fuel to get out of the hole and we launched the keynote club, which I'm very proud of. I then talked about personal readiness, getting your brain in the right place. I shared a tick list of seven things. I always cover three, lots of prep, doing something mindful right before you speak and protecting the night before. We then switched into speech readiness and I dissected what makes a decent speech, talked about seven things. And I shared at the end, perhaps work on one thing at once so that it's not overwhelming. And finally, I said, well, if you want to get your reps in, 
here's where you can go. And I'd love you to come to the keynote club. But if you do, I will not be held responsible for what else you go on to do. And you may well end up on Mars with Elon Musk. Thank you for uh, listening. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you, my friend. Um, there's, I'm just going to pick up on one chat message just here because it's, it's coming from John Torrens, who is another person who is very, very well versed in, in, in uh, speeches and pitches and presentations. He, he's, he's a coach as well in, in all of these things, his communications coach. And uh, he says, thank you, Max. That was excellent. And like, I, I just wanted to pick that out because there's a bunch of very, very lovely messages coming through right now. But um, from John in particular, then, then that's high praise indeed. So uh, it shows how far you've come, my friend. So oh, appreciate okay. that enormously. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of open questions. As you can see, Max, I actually managed to figure out the chat feature eventually. So uh, we, we got there in the end. So there's 18 open questions in the Q&A right now. <laughs> it's been a order, isn't it? So uh, let's go for some Q&A. Um, the, the first one I've read, uh, which is now the second question, uh, comes from Becca, who says, I tend to heavily rely on speaker notes out of fear of forgetting what I want to say, but then it doesn't sound authentic. Uh, any tips on how to ditch the speaker notes, please? It's a boring one. It is, it, it is about practice from so I so I believe that you can learn um you can learn something verbatim I mean I actually don't I started off by learning verbatim and then slowly learning a bit less verbatim mm -hmm. and then uh, one thing I will do is I might have the notes in my pocket so this is this is like a slightly dark one um I don't mean to make it dark but I had to speak at my dad's funeral last year and I just knew that I just had it in my pocket I, ne I needed notes in my pocket I never used them and I've, that's an extreme example, but then I've gone on to do that in some of the particularly ones that are high pressure to me. Um, I will have speaker notes in my, my pocket and I'll know I can use them if I want to. But, she, but the, quite, the person who asked the question is right. The best speech is actually there is a bit of a riffing mm -hmm. and uh, adapting if something happens that you can just latch onto, it makes it more relevant. Um, but the boring answer is practice. Um, and you can do it in little stages. So I'd be learning verbatim, learning a bit less verbatim, a bit less, a bit less. And then having some, having a backup is having a backup plan when the chat doesn't work is always good. Same day. <laughs> speaking notes. <laughs> I, I, I did put in the chat feature when it, when it turned on that I will be swearing at you later. For, uh... <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. Um, looped into this because there's, there's a question I want to follow up with. It's a question from Dominic uh, who asks, do you approach face-to-face -face presentations or speeches different to virtual ones? I mean, I, I actually do. Um, do I? I think as I started trying to do this face-to-face, -face, I've retrofitted what I do to Zoom and it just works. So um, all the things that I said are actually... Um, I think about for face to face body language is actually hard even though it sounds easier face to face there's more opportunity to do it i actually think it's harder um if you're working on body language and it's not doesn't come natural some people naturally just use their arms when they communicate some people don't and i think when you try and bring that in and it's not natural to you um it takes a lot of time actually and it can look it actually can look quite weird when someone's trying to use body language and it's not natural i think you get away with it more on zoom because there's just less of you. So I think that certain things become harder face to face. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer, but I think that ge the general principles are absolutely remain the same. There is some nuance. I always try and get in the room. People don't always like that uh, if they're asked you to speak and they find it sometimes weird. I, 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 I insist. I'm coming in, I'm checking that that adapter thing works from my computer to yours. I think there's more, here's the thing actually, in face to face, there's less technology that's at home, all the technology is in your control usually. Um, you know, me and Joe did a practice Zoom. In someone else's space, there's more things out of your control. So try and uh, shoehorn yourself into the environment early and make sure you've just tested all the things that aren't in your immediate control. Nice. I like that. And actually, um, it was one of the things that struck me when you were speaking about meditation, because I remember the first Manchester event that you and I ran together yeah. um, with James as well. And, and um, 
like, I don't know, it was like we were setting up for the event. And then like 10 minutes before it started or something like that, you, you just went, right, chaps, I'm, I'm just going to disappear and to, to, to go and meditate. <laughs> and like, yeah, you know, right. it, it was a it was a thing for me because like, on one level, it was like, well, you know, Max is disappearing for 10 minutes. But on another, you were quite insistent that that was a thing that you were going to do. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there here when you're speaking about the technology, which is, you know, it's okay to sort of be a little bit more insistent on your routine or like knowing where the lines are or knowing that the technology works or whatever it is. Because if you're going to be the one presenting, then you're going to be, you have to be comfort comfortable. You know, a lot of the theme of what you're presenting today was along those lines. So I think being insistent certainly served you really well in that moment. Um, and um, I, th I just think it was a really good idea and an example of you practically applying it. So um, there we go. Um, there's the next question that comes from Ellie. Um, and Ellie asks, uh, do you think giving a good introduction to yourself or backstory helps deliver better presentations or speeches? Often I find there's pressure to get straight into the business or maximize on time with content. But I think doing this can help uh, make you more personable and maybe hook your audience in more. I mean, um, I, think, I think she nailed it. I th well, two things I'll say is you want to practice your very first sentence, actually, I think. I see a lot of people start with really weak words, like so. So is a really common one. So it's not a disaster. It's just not, it, like, there's just a better way of, of, of opening. And your opening is like any introduction in life. There is a, first introductions are important. The uh, point on personal story first, I, I think it's good because we connect with, like, we connect, yeah, you want to learn about some rational stuff that's going to be uh, in the presentation. That's why you've turned up. But then at the same time, we crave emotional connection. We want to connect with humans. Um, a lot of people in this community definitely do know. I see that all the time. So I'm, I'm very pro. It doesn't need to be that long. Is it like if, if there's pressure to um, reduce it, I, uh, you can do it with, with a minute or even probably 30 seconds. But I think an introduction is important for me. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, sorry, one thing I will say is I see a lot of critique about speeches. And a lot of it, the critique is the opposite of the point that's made here. Why wasn't there an introduction to the person? I didn't know who was speaking. I actually see that critique quite often, certainly more than the other way around. Interesting. No, bang on. That's a really, really good point. I'm moving through these because like we're getting short on time, but like um, really, really great point. So thank you. Um, there's a question that comes from Aurora and it also came from Dave Harland. The famous Dave Harland, I think he prefers to be introduced as these days. Um, <laughs> we're getting everyone in trouble today. Uh, Aurora asks, any tips to stop those fillers from happening? So the huzz, the ums, the so's, uh, et cetera, in your, in your presentations. The way I, I have worked on it, and I'm quite high on the fillers. If you counted mine versus some other people that speak, I'm, I'm on the higher side. But the way I worked on it, with the first one was becoming aware. I was completely unaware, completely mm -hmm. unaware. And then it was uh, consciously doing a speech and trying to work on fillers and having someone count again. Like you need somebody to count. You need someone to keep score. Um, there's some quote about if you don't measure it, you can't manage it, whatever. Well, it's the, the truth is in that. You, you need to just have someone keeping score and actively work on it and then practice. But it's, uh, it's, it's I, I would do it. Some people go too far and remove them. I like some because I do think it makes you less robotic, more of a human and people like humans. So, um, but you, yeah, yeah, practice being aware. And then when you are practicing, actually having, you need a scorecard. It's as simple as that, I think. Perfect. Mate, that's our time. That's our hour, uh, which is insane. So you've smashed it. You've done such a good job. So much practical stuff in there as well. Um, and I know that, um, well, we've got Louise coming in right there saying brilliant session. Uh, we're getting too many comments now to, to, <laughs> to read them out, but the, 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 the general vibe is that, uh, folks are extremely grateful. So thank you very much, Max. And thank you for sharing your story. I think that grounds it in authenticity and in humanity. So, uh, that means an awful lot. And thank, you, thank you also to everyone in the community for putting up with me this morning. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> I'll be well reminded by Max, no doubt, as well as the rest of you to, to check my settings before we go live. Uh, so we will do that. So we've got the last uh, webinar of this season next Tuesday at two o'clock with Richard Cook from Monzo, uh, all about how to make uh, social media in quote unquote boring industries really stand out. Um, it's been a real sort of popular uh, talk in terms of sign up so far. And I really hope if you're not signed up already that you can make it next week as well. Uh, please do take the time to check out all of our sponsors and say thank you to them. That's the type of stuff that especially as we come towards the end of the season where we're going to have a bit of a break where like you'll get in the follow up email, uh, the people behind all these brands. If you could just say thank you to them on LinkedIn, if we could absolutely smash their inboxes today, it just like goes such a long way in displaying the value of the marketing meetup to them. Uh, but also, you know, it just makes them feel appreciated as pe pe people. So please do take the time to check out our sponsors and say thank you to them. With all that done, uh, that's us done for the week. For those of you in the UK, uh, please look after yourselves in the heat and uh, we're really, really Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you, Max, and, and thank you, everyone, for watching in today. See you soon.